Good evening. Hello, everybody. Will you please stand to welcome the class of 2019? amazing band please let me introduce them the band members are all members of the College of Performing Arts and please give another round of applause for Sergio Tabanico on tenor sax Asif Harris on baritone sax Jonathan Milberger on alto sax and after, and please join us at the, re at the reception where we'll be joined by their bandmate Solomon Gottfried on bass and Jacob Patron on drums. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Mary Watson, Executive Dean of the School of Public Engagement. Thank you. Please be seated, I think that's what I'm supposed to say. Uh, so uh, good evening and welcome. Um, I'm Mary Watson, Executive Dean of the Schools of Public Engagement, which includes the Bachelor's Program for Adults and Transfer Students, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Uh, before I begin my brief comments, I just want to um, recognize and acknowledge our respect for the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands the new school now stands and on which we are seated today. So I thought we would begin um, my remarks by uh, thanking and uh, giving a round of applause to all of the bachelor's program class of 2019. Congratulations. <laughs> and <laughs> hi. Uh, and I'd like also to thank all of the parents, partners, friends, family, and others here in the room. Our graduates could not have accomplished this night tonight without you, and we thank you all for everything you do. Uh, 
Uh, next, I'd like to recognize our exemplary faculty and staff with whom our graduates have worked and learned. They are deeply committed to, committed to our student success, and we thank them for all of their accomplishments, all of their time spent, and all of their hopes and wishes for you. And then with respect to the leadership, I have uh, two um, moments of recognition that I'd like to share with you. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dean of the Bachelor's Program and the Dean of Undergraduate Studies, Melissa Friedling, who completes her term as Dean of the school in June. Um, Melissa has brought her creative, scholarly, and leadership experience to her role as school dean and to her role in leadership in the bachelor's program area. Melissa is an accomplished film and video artist, a writer, and an educator. She will be taking a well-earned sabbatical, after which she will re re she'll be rejoining the faculty in media studies. So thank you to you, Melissa, for all your contributions. And my second thank you goes to Michelle Mater, who uh, is completing her term as director of the bachelor's program. The New School has benefited greatly from Michelle's vision for this adult education offering. And among her many contributions to the New School, Michelle recently brought acclaimed filmmaker Raul Peck to campus for an artist residency, hosted her a series of events around the city through Creatively Speaking and many other accomplishments. Thank you, Michelle, for all you do, um, and we appreciate you. Okay, so now back to you, uh, which is the reason that we're here tonight. So um, the, tonight is a ceremony to celebrate the tremendous achievement of all of you who are finishing your bachelor's degree. Um, for many of you, your journey began several years ago, or even several colleges ago, um, or even several places ago um, around the country and around the world. Um, and you and your colleagues come to our program from around the country, around the world, from a variety of fields to finish the education that you have started. Some of you started your education here, um, and more of you actually are finding a completion place for your degree. So for some of you, your earlier course of study was interrupted by career opportunities or family obligations or other kinds of challenges or sidetracks or opportunities or uh, changes of decision points. Um, and you have taken the great step and the great dedication to commit to yourself to return to school in this program, and it has taken an even greater determination not just to start, but to stay the course and to finish. And we celebrate that persistence and your accomplishment tonight. Congratulations. So as you may know, the New School was founded in 1919, and so we are celebrating our 100th anniversary. So you're graduating in the 100th year of the university, um, and you're graduating on a stage where many, many, many famous and important people have spoken over the, the, the decades that this building has been here, including people like Martin Luther King Jr., who gave his Race in America lecture series from this very stage on these very boards that you will walk across tonight. So in 1919, the new school began as a university that was supposed to upend the status quo of universities. Uh, the faculty who founded the new school left what they called the old school, Columbia University, to form a new kind of university that was predicated to lifelong learning, that was committed to research and scholarship and action in the world, and that was concerned with the pressing issues of the day. So in 1919, what were the pressing issues? They were things that included rising fascism around the world, uh, increasing sense of nationalism, uh, decreasing uh, amount of tolerance and respect for people who were different, complicated global political climate, um, complicated economics, and here we are 100 years later, and it turns out that some of those themes also ring true today. Um, so here, 100 years later, we are um, working very hard on these same issues. And so a couple of uh, hallmarks across those 100 years were first in 1933, when the new school expanded in order to host what was then called the University in Exile, which gave home to more than 180 intellectuals and their families who were fleeing persecution in Europe. That institution evolved into what we now call the New School for Social Research um, and um, still persists today, as does a global network of university and ex exile scholars. 
Ten years after 1933, in 1943, the new school began offering its bachelor's degree program, the one that you're in today, um, at that time to address the uh, educational needs of returning World War II re veterans and others. Our contemporary name is the Adult Bachelor's Program or the Bachelor's Program for Adults and um, Transfer Students that has persisted since 1943. A key player in the creation of this program was Clara Meyer. Clara pay, played a crucial role in establishing the new school and went on to spend 40 years of her career shaping the university into a place that is responsive to adult students, for her case, particularly female-identified students, um, who have long been successful to the success of our university. So Meyer had many titles. She was student trustee, assistant director, dean, and ultimately vice president. And when she was developing curriculum for the new school, she corresponded with luminaries, including Albert Einstein and W.B. Du Bois, concerning the education of adult students. And through those conversations, she built a conference and an educational curriculum that advanced the way we think about the way adults learn. Um, so now today, in this era of hashtag Me Too and hashtag Time's Up, and a time when female identifying, non-binary, queer, trans people, cisgendered people, and others continue to fight to have their voices heard and their rights be recognized, it's important to recognize that the stories of these have been all too often forgotten, and in some cases, erased. And people who have made impact on our world are not remembered in the way that they should. So to combat this issue, our own uh, Gina Luria Walker, who is a, pro, is a faculty in the bachelor's program, has developed a project called The New Historia, which interrogates issues of female identified people over the course of history, uh, has created a platform for untold stories to be shared, which has now gone into virtual reality, where you can actually traverse these histories through a virtual reality lens. So although it sounds like we've done a lot of things since 1919, we're also a lot the same. We still hold our founding values. We combine theory and practice. We focus on education with purpose. And we also look at the constantly changing world around us. And you're, you, the graduates of this program, are among the, the folks who will lead the way in this complicated and difficult time we find ourselves when change say, we say that change is the only way forward. So two alums I'll recognize, there are many, um, but just two that are, exam are examples of the kinds of changes being made by our students. Uh, one alumna, Renee Watson, is a New York Times bestselling author whose book focus on, fo book books focus on sharing the stories of underrepresented communities. Uh, she recently visited campus to launch her new book, Watch Us Rise, which is an adult, uh, young adult feminist anthem about raising your voice. And while on campus, she said that she used her learning from psychology and creative writing courses that she took here to write her first book, A Place Where Hurricanes Happen, after spending time in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. She next wrote a book called Piecing Me Together, which was centered on the ways that young people deal with hardships and the heartbreak of life. And she recently was awarded the Coretta Scott King Award and the Newberry Honor from the American Library Association. So like many uh, new school students and alumni, just like you, uh, she has worn many hats. She has been a writer, an activist, a social entrepreneur. She founded the I2 Arts Collection, I2 Arts Collection, a nonprofit organization, Harlem Nurturing Underrepresented Voices, um, and has been able to restore poet Langston Hughes's Harlem Brownstone. Uh, Renee is just one of the many people who've taken their new, new school education in the way that you will. Your fellow alums have founded and presided over social impact organizations and nonprofits. They're psychologists and art curators and professors and documentarians and journalists. And you join that network um, as an alumni yourself. Um, but the interesting thing about the students in this program is you've been doing this work for a very long time. You didn't just get started, and you're not getting started as you graduate. So your advantage at this moment, I think, is that you've been here at the new school, in this community that is different, at a university that is founded on the principle of change, and at a university that takes a critical stance. You didn't wait for the passive model of education to bring you to higher learning. You've been doing it and continuing to do it and building and making and developing and launching. You don't wait for permission. You use grit and determination and you work on the things that matter to you. You bring your whole self to everything you do in your communities and in your classrooms. You make media, write books, create websites, run campaigns, design curriculum, and lift up the voices of others. So you never just learned here at the New School, you challenged paradigms and assumptions, and dare I say, even the New School's paradigms and assumptions have you challenged. Um, 
So many commencement speeches will say that graduates, finally you're ready to leave the world, leave school and go out to the real world to take on the real challenges. But we know that's not true because all of you are not only ready, you've been doing this for a very long time. You're actually empowering yourself with your education and your community. You're on a brilliant road to address the challenging problems of the world ahead. And we are so very proud of you. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Dean Watson. Yes, I'm Melissa Friedling, and I am the, um, the dean of the school, I'm sorry, of the bachelor's program for adults and transfer students. Um, and I want to thank you, all members of the faculty and staff and proud parents, grandparents, loving and supportive partners, spouses, children, grandchildren, siblings, and devoted friends all gathered here. And to those of us joining us on live stream, um, congratulations to all of you, and especially to the magnificent bachelor's program graduating class of 2019. It's, it's an honor, it's an honor and a privilege to be, to celebrate your amazing achievements this evening. Um, to, tonight's recognition ceremony is a particularly special one. It is, as Dean Watson noted, um, the new school centennial year. And it's also almost exactly 75 years to the day since the bachelor's degree at the new school was chartered, since this bachelor's degree at the new school was chartered by the New York Board of Regents on May 19th, 1944. As the first bachelor's degree to be offered at the new school, this program was designed with adult learners in mind 75 years ago, and this recognition ceremony has acknowledged that those accomplishments for 75 years, of its, and acknowledged the accomplishments of the distinctive, unique, and inspiring students. Um, today, each of you in this graduating class of 2019 create your own paths to get here, as Mary had told us. You brought your experiences and you made a choice against often overwhelming challenges to complete your bachelor's degree. You are what makes this recognition ceremony of the adult bachelor's program the most special. In preparing my remarks for tonight, I did look back at the founding of this program and to the figure that Dean Watson already mentioned her in her remarks, the first dean of this program, Clara Meyer. Um, I was going to share some of Meyer's own commencement words, but have just a minute more here on this podium. So I'll, I'll instead extend an invitation to you. Um, during the first week of October, at the, as the culmination of our centennial um, events and celebrations, the new school will be hosting a week-long festival of the new. And that will include a dialogue that revisits a 1959 conference that Clara Meyer convened to interrogate the purposes, importance, and meaning of adult learning in our changing society. Your contribution to that discussion as graduates of this program will be invaluable, so I hope you will come back for that. Um, this is also an inv open invitation to all of you um, to please come back and keep in touch. I urge you to keep in touch. We want to know how you are doing. We want to hear your stories. What are your current passions? How are you pursuing them? We want you to come back and speak with current students and tell them about your experiences and your paths. Help them find their way during the times of uncertainty as others have done for you during your journey. During our ceremony, you'll hear reflections, comments, and stories from our four student speakers who are seated on stage, Melanie Quiros, Den Dennis Leo Stewart, Mika Lejan, and Oline Rodriguez Lopez. They'll each be introduced by a mentor, a teacher, and as you'll soon learn, there is no better way to articulate and honor the very particular and collective bravery, wisdom, commitment and accomplishments of our adult bachelor students than to have them speak that, that wisdom themselves. It's through their eloquence on behalf of their graduating colleagues that you'll get a sense of how very much we have to celebrate tonight. Adult bachelor's class of 2019, you are awesome. It has been an honor to address you and your love to us on this special day. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Jurgen von Moss, Associate Professor of Urban Studies, who will tell you about our first student speaker. Thank you. All right, uh, good evening, everybody, and congratulations to the graduating class. For us as instructors, it's actually, believe it or not, a quite a proud moment to have an honor like this to stand in front of you and congratulate you, knowing what you went through and how much hard work, all right, work-life balance, all right, doubt, fear, went into doing all this, all right? You guys, okay, all right. <laughs> I thought I can be heard, all right. 
And uh, it is, a, for me, a particular honor if one of my own students, somebody in my department, gets the honor to be graduation speaker. And Melanie Quiros is this person, and I'm incredibly proud of her because she's one of those BPAT students who came in here with a lot of credits somewhere done, right? But nowhere to go, right? She came in with an idea, she executed, she was proactive, she communicated her goals, right? She had a confidence, but also a humility about her to get done what needs to get done, right? So within less than two years, she graduated with honors, all right? And she applied to and got accepted in a BAMA pathway with Milano to pursue an urban policy degree. And if everything goes well, you'll be done in a year, all right? <laughs> and so, but right now, right now we're celebrating her accomplishment at this point, the bachelor's degree, and all the work, the hard work that went into it, your tenacity, your care for others, and your tremendous work that was just recently also published, which is pretty un unusual for somebody just graduating. All right. So with that, help me welcome Melanie Kurnos. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Jurgen. And a very warm new school welcome to all of our graduates, our guests, faculty, families, and friends. Thank you for joining us this evening to celebrate the accomplishments of all of our graduates in the bachelor's program for adults and transfer students. I'm sure my story is a very familiar one for all of you. I was working full time. I didn't know if I could transition back to school. I had all these reasons, excuses really, for why I was not ready to come back, ready to restart something and to finish it. The first time around was about making it to the finish line about going through all the steps and the motions of completing a degree. It was about checking boxes, completing all the requirements. And I was unsure if I wanted to put myself in that position again. But something about that first info session on campus clicked for me. Students at the new school are not just going to school. They aren't just ticking boxes. Students aren't going through the motions, especially not in the bachelor's program for adults and transfer students. And they aren't worried about feeling ready. Because the world is ready and ripe for change, and it isn't waiting for anyone. A former student at that info session said that you will never be ready, and it won't ever be the right time. This is just something you have to jump into and do, and they were so right. Being engaged in anything starts the same way, with the decision to take a breath and just get involved. You are not ready, but that does not matter. Just get involved, get informed, learn, try. There is always something that you can bring to the table. Everyone at the new school is doing something, helping someone, creating something, and bettering the world in their own way, big or small. And it's not a competition here. It's very inspirational. How's that project going? How was that interview? Did you get to publish that report? <laughs> Did the funding come through for your program? These are the kinds of questions asked in classrooms and hallways at the new school. You may not start off an expert in community engagement, design strategies, immigration, global food security, sustainable development, feminist literature, or cognitive neuroscience. These are just some of the things that we're studying here. But the new school has exposed you to people doing amazing things in this field that absolutely astound us. And they have shown you different paths, and you will envision different futures, not just for yourself, but for all the people in need, all the people living in an unfair or unjust situation. You will see the way forward for yourself and your part and responsibility to do what you can for them. It was at the new school that I learned that engagement doesn't always mean activism. It doesn't always mean going down to City Hall or up to Albany, to Washington or to the UN. It doesn't mean a bunch of finger wagging or anger or fury at the status quo. You don't just march or hold up signs, although chances are you did some of that at some point in your time here. But you also learned how else to be active here. You've read all the stories, you've seen all the data, and it's lit a fire inside of you. 
The new school has given us the tools to face that fury, to do something about it, when your feet are tired of marching, and because you have the intellectual and creative capacities to affect change at another level. Thanks to this program, I got to take my first graduate course because an advisor believed that I was ready even when I wasn't sure. I was interested in the topic, and a class seemed like a safe place to start. And then it turned out that every class session just wasn't enough to contain all of my curiosity, so I worked really hard on my projects, um, and they were full of potential to expand. So my professor, who happened to be actively working in this field, asked me to work on research with them. And I learned a whole new set of skills <laughs> from conducting this research, and all my newfound knowledge and abilities impressed another professor, and another professor, and another one. Uh, who happens to work at the kind of incredible firm, doing the kind of research with the kind of funding that I dream about. <laughs> so now I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place, except it isn't a bad thing. We all have these opportunities, and they aren't waiting for us to feel ready. We are ready. And so what's that famous saying? If you uh, love your work, you'll never work a day in your life. Well, I haven't worked a day since coming to the new school. My days here start at 6 a.m. and end close to midnight, but I haven't done an ounce of work. I've grown, I've learned, and I've thrived. I can see the change that my research has created. I can see my contributions to my small corner of the world. I have something to be proud of, and it isn't just a piece of paper. It's the culmination of relentless effort to learn how to be an engaged citizen. We have learned the skills that we need not just to do these projects for a grade, but to bring them to wider audiences and to expand on them during our careers, to expose the problems in society and to stick with them because we have ideas that become solutions and we have the skills to make those solutions real. And the new school doesn't shy away from your criticism. Your time here may not have been all rainbows and sunshine. You've had your storms. The new school community will still be here to help you find your way back to the important work that you're doing when you need it. After all, weren't we all just trying to find a way back when we got here? This may be the end of a formal degree, the end of a chapter of box ticking and checklists in its own way, but it's not the end of the change that you are making in the world. If anything, as cliche as it sounds, this is just the beginning. The degree you have earned here through your academic blood, sweat, and tears is an incredible accomplishment. And as for me, I will be here. <laughs> I'm currently working on my master's in public and urban policy at the Milano School for Policy Management and Environment. I am passionate about equity in urban education and the ways in which that we can use data to empower disadvantaged communities. This summer, I will be working with Slum Dwellers International in Cape Town, South Africa through the International Field Program with a group of eight classmates. In the fall, I'll be returning to complete my final independent analytic project, which is a client-driven policy analysis. And I will focus on urban education and desegregation efforts. I will be continuing my research at the Center for New York City Affairs, which is an education policy. And I'll be a teaching assistant for advanced quantitative methods, which is a course I took thanks to this program. And I'll be graduating again in December of this year. I do not feel any more ready <laughs> than I felt when I started. The new school doesn't get you ready the way that schools promise to get you ready for your future. It gives you the solace to understand that all the things that you see and imagine, they are beyond just you, but you owe it to the world and to yourself to just get out there, just do it. Don't sit there waiting to feel ready. You may be much better equipped than you were when you started and your ideas are more finely tuned, but you always had what it takes. The new school has a way of showing you that all those doubts you have about not being ready to do something, are just standing in the way of all the good you have to accomplish. We are ready. So congratulations to all my fellow graduates. Hello and uh, good, good evening and congratulations class of 2019. I'm Laura Kronk, the director of the Creative Writing Program here at the New School, and it's an honor and pleasure to present to you the graduating honors scholars of the Riggio Writing and Democracy Program. This program was launched 13 years ago through a grant from the founder of Barnes & Noble. Len Riggio does indeed love books, as you might expect, and wanted to support emerging writers while addressing what he saw in 2006 as a societal turn away from complexity and toward potentially dangerous ideology. 
I wish I could say these concerns are no longer relevant, but we all know how that's turned out. With Robert Polito, the founder of the MFA program here, the Writing and Democracy program was launched and continues to offer a rigorous and specialized education for students in the bachelor's program who are interested in deepening their engagement with writing, literature, culture, the arts, and politics. I want to thank and congratulate the family and friends of these graduates. You have loved and supported an exceptionally talented group of writers during a pivotal moment in their development. It isn't always easy, but I can promise you that it is an honor to have a writer in the family. <laughs> Graduates of this program have gone on to do some pretty amazing things, and I just want to call a few of those out. Some do actually support themselves with their writing, and I just want to say that for the family who wonder about that. It is possible. Um, some of them also publish books, and I want to say that two of our graduates have published books this month, Christopher X. Shade and Marissa Frasca. So Google them and get a hold of their books. You won't regret it. So many of our graduates pursue their writing and publish books while supporting themselves in related careers. We have an alum who's a journalist specializing in NYC homelessness, an alum who directs an education center, an alum who teaches writing to those held prisoner at Rikers Island, an alum who was a prison guard at Rikers Island and is now a social worker, an alum who is an organizer and artist who focuses on HIV AIDS, and so many more things. One last example is our alum who is an entrepreneur and launched a business called the Cheese Grotto, which is what it sounds like, a business producing tiny personalized storage systems for cheese. The core skill of the Writing and Democracy program, uh, the, the core skill that we aim to develop is the capacity to pay close attention. The capacity to pay close attention to cheese, but also <laughs> to language, to the media around us, the, to the particulars of our cultural moment, to the material in our own lives, and to our own creative impulses. We heard from the graduates who are graduating tonight at our annual thesis reading just a week ago. Their work was exceptional. It was vital, sophisticated, funny, devastatingly sad, beautiful, and I'll say it was as good as any work coming out of any of the top graduate programs in the US, and these writers are just getting started. So good. <laughs> I applaud the work they've done in their classes, sinking into difficult literature in courses like Tracy Ann Williams' courses on Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, considering the fullness and intersectionality of re real people in Madge, McKeith Madge McKeithen's nonfiction courses, editing with faculty advisor Seth Graves' 12th Street, the incredible publication that brings the work of New School students to a larger audience. And now I'm so excited to follow what comes next to all the ways that you will produce meaningful work and to con continue to be there for each other. This is just the beginning, and I look forward to all the ways that your work will go on to enrich our own. So would the, the Riggio scholars please come to the, the stage? I'm gonna ask, I believe Seth Graves is in the faculty group behind me. He's gonna help me shake hands, um, and we'll announce you. Nora Curridly. John Krug. Erica Peterson. Eileen Bridget Anders. John. <laughs> Good evening, class of 2019. I'm B. Banyu, and I'm chair of the Food Studies program here at the Bachelor's Program of Adult and Transfer Students. And I think I got this particular honor uh, because of that role. I'm uh, 
going to introduce you to the next student speaker, Dennis Leo Stewart. He's the very first food studies uh, major to be asked to be a student speaker at our recognition ceremony. So, <laughs> so in preparing these remarks, I thought, well, I'm going to email Dennis for some tips of what he would like me to say. Okay, his reply was very typically pithy and elegant. He said, and I love the order of this, I'm a husband, father, retired petty officer, U.S. Navy, and chef at Princeton University. I like cooking, reading, running, and mostly dogs. I gotta talk to you about the dog thing. Okay. Um, I suspect it may have been in the Navy when he traveled the world, as sa sailors do, sampling new cuisines, that Dennis may have flamed his passion for food. He is a classically trained chef. He studied at the French Culinary Institute, which is now the uh, International Culinary Center. And, and as I mentioned, he currently works for campus dining at Princeton University, which is a super good job. When Dennis returned to school, I seem to remember that he wanted to enter the managerial ranks of campus dining, and he needed his bachelor's degree um, uh, to do that, uh, which is a very laudable goal. Many of you will share that interest in bettering yourself in your career. His experience here seems to have changed his goal and goals, and I hope to hear a little bit about that in his talk, because in another email he wrote, I'd like to teach culinary and food studies in a technical school environment. In fact, I did a little research on the Princeton website and found out that he already has started to share his knowledge of food, culture, and culinary techniques through Princeton's Teaching Kitchen Collaborative, which has the purpose to uh, advance personal and public health through culinary literacy and integrative lifestyle transformations. I'm hoping that we hear a little bit more about Dennis's own transform transformative experience here at the New School in his talks, but we'll have to see. Uh, okay. All right. Um, as both Melissa and Mary Watson mentioned, this is a super special program, the Bachelor's Program for Adults and Transfer Students. It was, in fact, founded for the very purpose of serving our veterans. And of course, Dennis is a veteran. So we were founded to serve him, all right? So I have the great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Dennis Leo Stewart. Thank you, B, for that uh, introduction. <laughs> Um, I'd like to still extend my heartfelt gratitude to the faculty, the family, the friends, and the uh, graduating class of 2019. I graduated high school in 1976, 43 years ago, I think. Before coming to the new, to the new school, I was a retired chief petty officer of the United States Navy. In the Navy, we went all, we went all over the world tasting foods and learning quite by accident the cultures of many places. I was not a cook in the Navy, but my start as a foodie did start in the Navy going to all these places. For example, I remember this one very special time we were going to Hong Kong, and it was just before they were going to give Hong Kong back to the Chinese. And I was the leading petty officer of a division of about, a, about 80 people, and most of them were under 21, or 21 and under. And they were, I remember, they were ex very excited because McDonald's was making their first restaurant opening in Hong Kong. <laughs> and for the life of me, I, I couldn't figure out why they were excited about McDonald's. I wanted to go everywhere else and eat everything else. I wanted, to, I wanted to taste the food on the streets, the traditional res, restaurants and everything. I thought they were nuts, okay? And it wasn't for me. So I met a uh, Chinese teacher in the USO who wanted to learn more English. So we made a deal. He'd take me to places to eat, 
and I'd teach him English. He didn't want to learn proper English, he wanted to learn slang and the, the way we talk rather than the proper English. So we went to a different places. I remember the first place he took me to, like it was yesterday. We went to an area in Hong Kong where the entire street was lined with food vendors. Some of the places had tables and some of the places didn't. Some had chairs and some had onapies, but most of, the time, most of the people stood and ate their food right there and walked on. We went to a place that actually had tables and I let him order. And before our food came, they brought a bowl of water with a lemon in it. And they set it down in front of us. I thought it was a palate cleanser, so I drank it. <laughs> it was for cleaning your hands. There was a little old lady in the corner smoking a pipe, and she was just laughing her butt off. She was, <laughs> so I asked, you know, why is she laughing? And, she, and the, uh, the guy's name was Sammy. He said, because you just drank the water you're supposed to wash your hands with. Okay, I didn't make that mistake twice. Experiences like those stayed with me and propelled me later to the French Culinary Institute. Um, I received my culinary degree. Um, after that, I returned to the FCI and got my pastry degree. And I was scheduled to take the managerial course as well, but I wanted to go to work. So I went to work. I was 43 at the time, and I worked a couple places here, a couple places there. Um, one you may have heard of is called Rat Rat's Restaurant. Um, in Hamilton, New Jersey. It's from the uh, Wind in the Willows. It's a, a four-star restaurant, probably the only one we have in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> then I got hired at Princeton University, and I really like my job there. It's a, it's a good place to work. I had the opportunity to, in, to continue my education at the new school, but I didn't, I didn't know really why I would. I was you know, kind of fat and happy. I was working where I wanted to work. I was happy with my family, my life, and everything. So I figured I'd take one or two courses just to see how it went. After reading the information from the new school, I'm glad I did. From the first moment at the new school, I, re I realized that inclusion and diversity are not simply buzzwords here but the way of elevating learning. When looking at issues from all sides, the image is more defined and clearer. When all voices are heard and listening is more important than speaking, opinions can be expressed without hindrance or fear. Creative, creativity becomes inherent and the value that creates a better world are within the grasp of every student. These are innovations that the new school was built upon and continues to display. Trust and non-judgmental spaces to create initiative are embedded in the new school classrooms. Since arriving at the new school, my understanding of the world has changed. As a human being, we have basic necessities, one of which is food. No matter where you go, you must eat to survive. Food has the ability to connect everybody together. I wanted to know more about that food. Why? I also wanted to know why there are food deserts. Why does 90% of the corn that we eat have traces of Roundup in it? Why is the richest country in the world, why do we still have malnutrition? I was guided on this quest by some amazing professors, and I'd like to thank some of them. I learned that there is a language of food through working with one of the best people I've met, Professor Roseanne Gold, in the back. <laughs> in the language of food, there's history, there's culture, there's racism, and so much more. Professor Andrew F. Smith showed me that criticism showed me that writing about food is an art for its, within itself, even if writing about food is the criticisms. In her course, Professor Shane Figueroa showed how to distribute, how your distribution relates to school lunches and how fast food influences our culture. 
while also somehow being grateful for the mentoring and instruction I received from Professor Alejandro Crawford, who mentored so many students in getting their businesses off the ground and while maintaining his own. From my experiences with these professors in my classrooms, I will take away a new way of looking at cultures around the world. In the United States, we cannot tell who is an American by the way we look at them or by what they eat. I liken it to Thanksgiving dinner at my family's. With my family, some you know, some you don't want to know, and some you just know too well. But when it comes to food, we eat, and we love to eat. No cultural appropriation intended, but ethnic foods when taking into account the difference of abilities. It helped me to be a citizen of the world, since I can't afford to travel the entire world. At the new school, I have been to the UN with uh, Morgan Fair to, um, Nightingale to hear about cities that are making a difference in sustainability and infrastructure to their local food systems. I lost my place, sorry. <laughs> Oh, well, skip it. As I mentioned, I am a retired Chief Petty Officer of the United States Navy. After 20 years of active duty service, military training, and a life of hard times, I came to the new school to learn, but I had to unlearn first. In the military, there is no individuality. There is no diversity, no opinions, no thinking outside the box. The new school is more than a classroom, textbooks, and writing, pa writing pages. It is a center for seeing, looking, listening, and speaking with respect for all empathy, not sympathy. For me, this has been a, a game changer. With the knowledge and connections I've made here at the new school, I believe I can make a small difference in my community. That alone is greater than the sum of the courses I've taken here. I invite you, the graduates of 2019, to take the knowledge that you gained during your time at the new school and use it to be part of a positive change needed to navigate these, this complex world. Thank you and congratulations 2019. Good evening, everyone. Congratulations to the graduates of the class of 2019. My name is Tracy Ann Williams, and I'm the Director of Academic Affairs for the Bachelor's Program, Adults and Transfer Students. I also offer classes in African American Studies, Gender Studies. So I'm going to be introducing our next speaker. And it's a pleasure to introduce Mika Lejon. OK, they're starting already. <laughs> Mika joined the bachelor's program in fall 2016, having relocated to New York from Toronto, Canada with her husband, Michael. I first met Mika over the phone for advising. This advising meeting is a kind of mini orientation to the program and advising as well as a kind of nuts and bolts um, course planning session. Mika was exceedingly prepared having mapped out her entire degree. I would venture to say she might have mapped out everyone's degrees. Um, <laughs> however, I could tell that she was thoughtful and smart, qualities that were punctuated by that darn Canadian sunshiny optimism, and I can feel it like right here. During her time in the bachelor's program, Mika took a range of courses in writing, as well as arts and social engagement and critical race studies. I had the pleasure of having Mika as a student in three courses where she consistently produced work that was impeccably executed and very well thought out. While doing these impressive academic papers, I'm assuming across the board, Mika also developed her talents as a scholar in the Riggio program for writing and democracy. As well, she worked for the arts education organization, no longer empty, first as the education programs manager and now as the director of education. I think Mika has launched six to seven businesses in the time that I've known her. Most recently, a venture involving an app that promotes connectivity. She likes to tell me about it, and I understand the words individually, but together, I don't know what she's talking about, so I just smile. 
She somehow did all of this while earning a cumulative GPA of 4.0. <clears throat> and she did this GPA thing because she is, well, Mika. I had the honor of serving as her thesis advisor for the Riggio program. Her thesis, called Staring at Art, is a hybrid text combining prose, poetry, photographs, and speculative fiction. When reading the innovative text that she created, I wanted to lose myself in the world encompassed within. A portion of that thesis, um, that thesis really exemplified Mika's talent and potential as a writer. And mark my words, a portion of this thesis will be a Netflix series soon. You heard it tonight. Though Mika is relocating to Los Angeles in a few months, her words and spirit will stay with me. I can't wait to hear what she does next. Tonight, Mika will be speaking about how she reconnected with herself and rediscovered community here at the New School. Please join me in welcoming Mika Lejean. Good evening. Hi, Dad. <laughs> My name is Mika Lejean, and I am honored to join you all this evening to celebrate the successes of this year's graduates. I first discovered the New School while walking on my second trip to New York from Toronto. I was walking east um, towards Union Square, found myself passing the building in we're in today, and thinking to myself, what is this weird, funny little building tucked away on West 12th? This very funny, not so little school became a hub for me, a place of excitement, opportunity, and community. Upon acceptance, as Tracy Ann mentioned, we had our very first conversation, and she called to advise me on my course selection. To give a background, um, I am what you may call a planner. I make spreadsheets, I make labels, I systematize everything. Um, so as Tracy Ann said when we spoke on June 7th, 2016, I had created a list of all of the classes I had planned to take that semester, the semester following, and the one following that. And she matched my style that day in much the same way she has since and did today, with a deep laugh, complete support, and generous space for experimentation. And I thank you very much, Tracy Ann. So at the New School, here's where I really rediscovered what community truly means. As a member of the Riggio Honors Program for Writing and Democracy, I had the opportunity to ideate with, edit the work of, and provide feedback to brilliant writers who modeled the potential of a fearless writing voice. I rediscovered my own resiliency in really sharing some of the long-hidden stories of my childhood. In the first 18 years of my life with my mother, I lived in over 45 places. Many of them were family or homeless shelters. So coming clean about my adolescence for me, publicly, and here very publicly, was the most vulnerable and liberating feeling. And thanks to the lovely humans that I've had the opportunity to meet and work with here, I had the opportunity to really also practice allyship. And sometimes that means standing up, and sometimes that means standing back. But either way, the conversation is always worth it. And I'd like to recognize Basil Soper, who's not here with us th this evening for that. Here at the New School, I rediscovered what community truly means. Growing up as a mixed race child in Canada, in Toronto, which is considered one of the most multicultural cities in the world, identity was often a vague idea to me um, and not particularly rooted in race. So my definition of identity has certainly changed over the last three years. And until I took one of Tracy Ann's classes, I had not actually interrogated my own answer to the question, what is blackness? And I would still full, like, lack a full answer, um, but I feel fulfilled and inspired from the challenging conversations that I've had with all of my peers. The diverse student body that comprises BPATS is what makes the School of Public Engagement the best school. It's open and interdisciplinary approach attracts a very particular type of person. And without that, I would never have met some of the wonderful people I now have as friends. So I would like to thank you, Sandra and Oleen, and uh, the greater audience of the, the graduating class for being here. And you, Thea, I see you. 
At the new school, I rediscovered what community truly means. I was often challenged here by the proactive, forward-thinking thought experiments that are posed to us by professors. Many final papers turned into bona fide 17-page critical essays for me, anyway, that impacted how I see the world and how I interact in it. I am extremely grateful for the opportunities that I was given and able to grab because of the extended community here. As Tracy Ann mentioned, I've spent the last two years directing an arts education program for underserved youth here in New York City, and the fellowship that originally started that led to a director position because of classes I took here. In September 2016, I walked into the arts and social engagement class, my very first class on my very first day at the new school. And this past March, I had the opportunity to actually uh, visit that class again with one of the students I've been working with with this year's students in that program. So this community at the new school has fully enabled me to come full circle. And I'd like to thank Julia Folks and Gabrielle Bendinoviani, who I'm not sure if you were here, but I... Oh my gosh, you're in the back. Hi, thank you. Um, okay, and then, as I was saying, so in order to build community, you really have to set those ground rules. And this extends beyond the basics of what a safe or like a brave space are, beyond this critical thinking and questioning. And to build community, you need to establish accountability. And while there have been some controversial occurrences here on campus, a fact which I also need to note to keep myself accountable, the new school is a space where students strive to uplift each other and follow through and encourage each other's strength, uh, strengths and strategies. It is a place where we push each other through the difficult moments and most importantly, where many students dedicate themselves to challenging the status quo. In order to build community, you must prioritize curiosity. The core function of college is supposed to be to enable us to find ways to work on some of the biggest problems in the world the ones that we're passionate about and cannot rest until we address them. Creativity and innovation drove me and my wonderful husband and collaborator to make waves. Yes, you. Yes, round of applause. <laughs> Um, and as Tracy, I was saying, so Waves is a social platform for self-expression and connection and is a truly genuine human digital social space. It is Waves video in the App Store. And I would, again, like to thank you, Michael, for pushing me to go above and beyond every goal I set for myself and for helping edit every single paper that was 17 pages that I wrote here at the New School. <laughs> In order to build community, you must value generosity. Providing limitless opportunities to mentor and work with collaborators across disciplines creates an incredibly beautiful melange of ideas and solutions. When people ask me what I graduated with, I give them the long, fancy title that I titled it myself, which is Intersectional Pedagogies Through the Arts and Social Engagement. What does that mean? I looked at education and systems of learning and through teaching uh, race, class, and gender lens and considering into how the arts and social community um, engagement impacts that. During my time here, I was able to apply the work that I've been doing with teens to my academic studies and vice versa. And at the new school, we focus on creative problem solving and interdisciplinary solutions. It was clear from taking, talking to many current students, alumni, and now all of us that we know the future is ours to change and paying it forward impacts all of us. Over the last two years, I was able to build a 2.0 version of myself, to call out what values I hold close and what I will no longer stand for, and to build a community of people who have radically changed how I understand my own life. As we all know, BPATS is an eclectic group of students. Our range of backgrounds, interests, and quirks offer limitless opportunities to bring about meaningful and unexpected change. Our diverse approaches to life enable us to view the world in a way very different from most others. We have all worked so hard and sacrificed so much to walk the graduation stages this week, and I am beyond grateful to join you all in such a celebratory moment. I'm excited to see what is to come, and I also feel deep responsibility because we are in charge of the future. The world will take form based on what we do to shape it, and as I'm sure we all can agree, there is a lot to get done, so let's do it. Thank you. Hello, and congratulations to the class of 2019. Uh, my name is Oju Agarwal, and I am uh, an assistant professor of anthropology and experiential learning here at the bachelor's program for adults and transfer students. Um, it's my pleasure today to recognize those students whose academic achievements and professional goals earn the honor of one or more of three scholarships established by generous donors to BPATS. Uh, so, the first is the Bernard Osher Foundation Scholarship, which, transfer, which targets high-achieving undergraduate adults, ages 25 and up, who have returned to finished degrees after being out of school for several years. If there are Osher scholars in the audience, please come to the stage. Okay. Okay, so if you can come up.
Brett Anthony Collette. Nicole Samea, oh, uh, Nicole Samella, Sam, no, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Sid Monroe. <laughs> Jordan Alexandra Silman Goldstein. <laughs> Luisa Esther Valcazel. Juliana Carolyn Mulligan. So the second set of scholarships is the Jacobson Newcomb Scholarships for mature adults, which helps students 25 and older who, who are returning to college to complete their degrees. If any of these scholars are in the audience, please come to the stage. Okay, um, so the last set of scholars uh, are the Kirshner Memorial Scholarships in Theater and Performing Arts, which assist students training for careers on stage. If there are Kirshner scholars present, please come to the stage. <laughs> Jordan Kennedy Raymond. <laughs> Angelica Tisiera. And congratulations again to all the scholarship recipients and to the entire class of 2019. Good evening, everyone. Hate to see you guys go. There's so many of you I know here so well. But you're an amazing class. You definitely need to give yourselves another round of applause. My name is Michelle Matera, and it's been my pleasure and honor to be the director of the bachelor's program for the last three years. And it's really going to be sort of bittersweet uh, leaving this position, but I'm not going anywhere. Don't worry. I'll be around, just, uh, just not in the office maybe every day. Uh, but it's my pleasure also this evening to present uh, students who've had a managed to contain, maintain a 3.7 grade point average or better for their entire time here at the new school. So would the honor students please come up to the stage. So these students. These students have managed to maintain this GPA in spite of their activist duties, their motherly duties, fatherly duties, their jobs, their careers, and still maintaining this amazing grade point average. So please come be acknowledged. Nicole Samara. Yeah, nice you. to meet you. Good to congratulations. <laughs> Jordan Kennedy Raymond, congratulations. <laughs> Juliana Mulligan, congratulations. <laughs> Donna L. Stevens, congratulations. <laughs> Morgan Lee Nightingale, congratulations. <laughs> Gabriella Bloomgarden, congratulations. <laughs> Anna Fostia, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Eric Schrader Bedell, thank you. I know this guy. Theo, <laughs> Theodore Walker, congratulations. And Mika Halajan again. <laughs> so I have the pleasure of announcing all of the graduates' names. So, would the graduates please come forward?
graduates, I'm also going to ask you to walk in front of me so that people can actually see you instead of coming behind. They don't want to see me. They want to see you. So walk here and that way. Okay. Melanie Quiroz. Dennis Leo Stewart. <laughs> Mika Lejon. <laughs> Oline Rodriguez Lopez. Nora F. Kiridley. John Lewis Krug. Erica Fukumoto Peterson. Eileen Bridget Anders. Angelica Marguerite Teixeira. <laughs> Brett Anthony Collett. <laughs> Sid Monroe. <laughs> Jordan Alexandra Smilin Goldstein. Nicole Danielle Samala. <laughs> Lois Falcasell. <laughs> Jordan Kennedy Raymond. <laughs> Juliana Carolyn Mulligan. <laughs> Donna L. Stevens. Morgan Lee Nightingale. Gabriella Bloomgarden. I've got people trying to trick me and see if they know their names. And Anna, Anna Fostia. Eric Schrader Bedell. Theodore Wilkins. Amani Octavia Orr. Farwa Abbas. Gregory Loxton. Micah Morales. <laughs> Cynthia Carolyn Nieder. <laughs> Raphael Gadank Flaxberg. <laughs> Callie Ella Thomas Siegel. <laughs> Sandra Stolar. Jocelyn Duran. <laughs> and, I mean, do you see it all though? It's, it's, you don't know. Chloe Charlotte Mirka Young. <laughs> Sarah, 
Samantha Ray Simon. <laughs> Sunasia Turnbow. Edmund George Eisenberg. <laughs> Matthew Delgado Ruskin and featuring my boyfriend Jackson. I've known Jackson from before he was born. It's the whole thing. <laughs> Peyton Towns Watson. <laughs> Johan Lavu. <laughs> Tyler James Simmons. <laughs> Stephanie Lee Barton. Hillary Lynn Maxfield. Adolfo Espinosa. Gerard Robert Young Salentang. Erica Kramer Hart. Angela Teresa Royal. <laughs> Lena Rose Trieger. <laughs> Mahir Feroz Khan. <laughs> Natalie Yvonne Garcia. John Marco Colucci. Graham Witten Cox Bailey. Bettina Lobo Diaz. We have an elaborate um, email relationship. It's the whole thing. Uh, Mel <laughs> Melanie Sue Logan. We've never met in person. <laughs> Angela S. Bitney. <laughs> Bryn Marsh Knickle. <laughs> Margarita Hernandez. Fung Bu Tran. <laughs> Ileana Gerber. <laughs> Austin Taylor Smith. <laughs> Jana Akimova. <laughs> I asked her if she believed that she was graduating now. She doesn't. It's been a whole thing. It's been a thing. Deandra Brunson. Congratulations to all of our graduates. me again, I'm sorry. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final speaker this evening, Oline Rodriguez Lopez.
In so many ways, Olene epitomizes the kind of student we hope will join our community. Having briefly attended the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, this native New Yorker found their way back home and has been working professionally as a nonprofit youth educator and community organizer in various social justice organizations. Currently, Olene works at the National Domestic Workers Alliance and is involved in community responses to HIV AIDS with a deep dedication to decentering whiteness in the historicization and cultural production of the ongoing crisis. I first met Olene as a visitor in my fall 2014 seminar on the author Toni Morrison's work. Typical of Olene, not sitting back, they jumped right into the classroom discussion and didn't shy away from the difficult themes we were discussing. I have to say I wasn't surprised to soon see Olene again as a student in the bachelor's program. Olene has grown immeasurably while here, refining their critical thinking and writing skills over the past four years. They are passionate, resilient, and smart with a sensitivity and humility that often gives me pause. I am not the only one who has seen Olene navigate this academic space deftly. My colleague, Ricardo Montez, who cannot be with us this evening, has also witnessed Olene's development as a writer and thinker over these four years. Because Olene took some 11 courses between Ricardo and me, I'm gonna repeat that. Between Ricardo and me, Olene took 11 courses. I felt like I, should talk to, to, to Ricardo as well about Olene. So I asked Ricardo for a few words about our dear student, and he shared the following, which he wrote directly to you. Thank you for understanding the classroom as an important contingent space of collectivity, as difficult as that collective might be at times. I learned so much from you, you who fully grasp the false promise of safe space while gracefully maneuvering the landmines embedded in the very material we deem necessary. Olene, after having you as a fixture and vital presence in my courses for almost four years, to not have you there this fall will be both happy making, because I know you're getting out, <laughs> but also poignant for me. I agree with Ricardo that we are all better for your astute observations and the care you demonstrated in striving for something much more profound, expansive, and supportive than a static, normative idea of safety. We will miss you, but your work is needed out there, and you are so needed out there. Tonight, Olene will be centering their comments on the theme of carrying what it means to carry others as well as to be carried. Please give a warm welcome to Olene Rodriguez Lopez. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Tracy Ann Williams, for the introduction and inviting me to speak tonight. I'm thankful that Tracy Ann actually entrusted me with a microphone for a limited time. <laughs> um, thank you, speakers, faculty, staff, um, dear friends and family for being here tonight. Um, I should move this here. Um, I'm so thrilled to celebrate with the class of 2019. And I want to say how affirming it feels to be here with you all. Finding a, way, finding a way to return to school, being an adult student, balancing your work commitments, possibly having a social life in between, whatever that means, being a, and also being accountable to your loved ones. Our stories of what led us here to the new school might be different and also share similarities. Possibly, we share a commonality based on having the people in our lives who carried, inspired, loved, held us, and which made it possible for us to celebrate today. My own story starts with my two immigrant parents, my mother from El Salvador and my father from Mexico. To be quite honest, I barely saw my parents growing up because they worked all the time. Um, my dad worked three jobs in the food service industry for over 20 years, 
and my mom was a full-time domestic worker. They both sacrificed so much to build a better life for, for my siblings and I. In the working class neighborhood of Sunset Park, Brooklyn, in the late 80s and 90s where I grew up, many of my friends were constantly reminded by their surroundings, lack of resources, and education opportunities that their lives were disposable and also less valuable. As a young person, I felt that education wasn't meant for me and I couldn't relate to any of the materials and was told by educators that I was not smart and would not succeed. Since my parents were working long hours and away from home, my older siblings, Aloisa, hi, and Ozzy took care of me and my other sister, Selena. Um, they, took, they took us under their wings. From an early age, my brother encouraged me about the potentiality about education as a pathway to opportunities and as a tool to challenge injustice. At the time, I was in middle school, and I was confused about why he liked the idea of me going to college when I thought I would even be lucky to graduate from high school. I was more interested in becoming a basketball player. I watched Space Jam, Space Jam a lot. <laughs> that was in the 18th century. Um, <laughs> Ozzy said that college could possibly get me there. Um, so most days after school, after completing my homework assignments, Ozzy and I would play basketball at Sunset Park's basketball courts. Yes, the park is called Sunset Park. It's kind of redundant. <laughs> Anyways, he'll hold my hand as I walk to the park, play basketball, and then eat ice cream. We had this tradition for a while, and it was very sacred to me. In the spring of 2000 and 2001, Ozzy got a job as a food service worker. He also earned his GED at this time as well. Ozzy was becoming an active leader at our local church, protesting against police brutality in our neighborhood, getting involved in, student, in, sorry, getting involved in unionizing efforts in his workplace, an amazing DJ, and was also supporting his friends through life challenges. Ozzy was the embodiment of the best part of my parents' work ethic, my own neighborhood, a place that I deeply care about. In my neighborhood, people of multiple ethnicities, races, cultures live together, creating systems of support through self-expression, through subculture, solidarity, and survival. One of the most important things to Ozzy was being the best dad that he could be to my niece, Genesis. All of these qualities were incredibly inspiring to me, and it was privileged to witness his growth as a complex individual. On the early morning of September 11, Ozzy went to work. He worked on the 101st floor of the first World Trade Center. My brother, a person who carried me throughout my young life, passed away that day. The loss of Ozzy impacted my entire world. My brother was gone. I was incredibly heartbroken at the age of 12, not knowing who to be, who and what to be angry at. But when I turned on the TV, what I learned in school, what I learned from America's leaders, is that individuals in the Middle East were responsible for 9-11, and our government needed to protect our country. That America was also at risk because of immigrants who were undocumented and labeled as dangerous. It didn't matter that this rhetoric was rooted in xenophobia, Islamophobia, ignorance, and racism. My life changed as had many of the domestic and international communities. These issues are sadly still relevant and in some ways even more present today. Post 9-11 brought immense grief and loss, and it also shaped my political and, and social trajectory in thinking critical and challenging national security, patriotism, and the United States government justifying war and violence. Not only did my brother lay the groundwork and my foundation to education and social justice, but what was occurring in the world also made me see my responsibilities. In 2003, I attended a socialist, aka progressive, high school called Humanities Preparatory Academy, located just a few blocks away from here in Chelsea, New York. Following my brother's example, I began to get involved in, un in um, organizing efforts against the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, participated in student-led sit-ins against installment of metal detectors, wrote critical essays about the historic interventions in Central America, and lastly, came out as queer and found the first gay straight alliance on campus. Things were, things were as good as can possibly be. Soon I was college bound. So my first attempt at college was in 2008 when I briefly attended the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. I wanted to study at a progressive university, be involved in student activism on campus, and be in extremely far away from New York City. 
But let me tell you, as soon as I got there, I realized how far away I was from New York City. <laughs> it was quite a culture shock when I got there. The tall buildings, um, the tall buildings were replaced with evergreen trees. I should have seen this coming. I mean, the college is called Evergreen. <laughs> Downtown Olympia was about 10 blocks long and nothing was opened after 9 p.m. Um, and I focused on um, environmental studies, which seemed like the right fit for me. But after my first semester, I dropped out due to financial barriers and poor academic performance. While at Evergreen, I felt like I had little support and needed to find community that cared about my well-being and growth. So I decided to take a different route in my education and pursue full-time work as a social justice organizer. By the fall of 2014, after six years of the grind, I was feeling burned out after working as a food justice, LGBTQ, and youth organizer. I love organizing and mentoring students through food justice work, and I knew it was time to return to school to complete my bachelor's degree. I wanted to achieve my dreams to be an educator and teach young people. With the support of my family and friends, um, I was encouraged to apply to school. Yet, I was terrified. One day, I took time off of work, went to campus to pick up information about the new school, I learned about its self-designed liberal arts program, flexibility for working adults, and its courses on race and ethnicity studies, and being open to earn prior, prior learning credits from my activist work. It felt, like a brush of, it felt like a breath of fresh air knowing that the program existed. By the following week, I signed up to attend an information session and was emailed information to sit in two classes of my choosing. Without hesitation, I visited Tracy, Dr. Tracy Ann Williams reading Toni Morrison course, <laughs> and Professor Michelle Mateo's race, ethnicity, and class in the media. Um, after sitting, sitting in those classes, I knew I needed to come to the new school to be in a place where I can improve my writing, research, and scholarly skills, and receive the mentorship and resources I needed to better challenge, educate, and write about systems of power. So my own experience as a Salvadorian, Mexican-American, queer, and transgender person has the potential to inform me what it feels to be ostracized. Being at the new school allowed this space to feel uncomfortable, grow, and learn about the ways that I myself am complicit and also benefit from systems of power and oppression. Courses at the new school ha has helped me learn about the, important of sus the importance of, sust of creating sustainable long-term community linkages in order to dismantle white supremacist structures. Though, when I started this degree, unsure of my own abilities as a writer, educator, and, and aspiring underground club scene historian, the new <laughs> The new school provided the opportunity to connect and work with the organization Visual Aids and produce an oral history of Luna Luis Ortiz, a legendary photographer and HIV activist in New York City's ballroom and voguing scene. As we leave the new school to go party, and maybe you'll forget everything I said, I understand, um, let's continue to fight for the liberation of all people. When moments of fear and doubt are felt, I'll share with you a quote that Dr. Tracy Ann Williams once shared by Zora Neale Hurston. She writes, no, I do not weep at the world. I am too busy, busy sharpening my oyster knife. At times, I'm sure it will feel scary, exhausting, uncomfortable, and tired some. And let's use the tools and implement the learnings that have been generously shared with us to challenge injustice. Earlier, I mentioned about honoring the people who carried and supported us and made it possible for us to celebrate today. I want to take a brief, brief moment to thank the people who also have carried me throughout these four years. To my family, thank you. To my beloved brother, Ozzy, and my chosen family. And also, I'm gonna include my barber, uh, my barbers, <laughs> my community. Um, this degree is, is for you. Professor Ricardo Montez, who is not here, um, thank you for seeing my potential as a writer and scholar and for your immense kindness. Thank you, Ted Kerr, for your mentorship, care, and crucial feedback. Thank you, Michelle Mater. Hi. Thank you for your support and sharing your expertise on race, ethnicity, class, and media. Um, I'd like to honor someone who is not here with us physically, but here in spirit, Dr. Hunt, Dr. T.K. Hunter, who passed away last December and was one of my first professors here at the New School. 
I had the great honor to take her courses on black intellectuals and the black aesthetic, African American arts and culture, and she is so deeply missed. And most importantly, Dr. Tracy Ann Williams. I am forever grateful for your patience, so much patience, because <laughs> I'm so ignorant. Um, wisdom shaking up my world with everything you taught in the classroom, inspiring me to write a book, being my advisor and advocate for holding my hand through the toughest heartbreaks and celebration. You are a powerful force and angel. Thank you. And lastly, let's hold ourselves accountable to carry others by making space listening to what folks need, being open to feedback, supporting the self-determination and leadership of LGBTQ, non-binary people, women of color, young people, disabled people, undocumented people, and others who have been excluded and marginalized in spaces and institutions. By appreciating and honoring our differences, we can build true, true unity. We need it now more than ever. Congratulations, class of 2019. Si sapudo. All the student speakers, they were mighty and amazing. And actually, another round of applause, please. For all of you. Thanks, thanks once again also to our fantastic faculty who have served not simply as teachers and colleagues, but also as mentors and friends, as you can hear from your, these speeches. And thanks to all of the staff who have worked tirelessly throughout this year to help us all, and who have worked especially hard to make this recognition tonight so special. They deserve a huge round of applause again. <clears throat> and last but not least, once again, let's not forget to thank the mighty, mighty adult bachelor's class of 2019. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm going to ask that you please remain seated until all the students are out of the theater. Um, so we're going to commence with the exit. When you exit, do not block the theater doors. Go directly to the lobby elevators and take them to the fourth floor, where we're going to have um, a, a beautiful reception that I invite you all to. Um, students who receive awards, pick them up on the fourth floor as well um, for the reception in Willman Hall. There'll be people to direct you outside. Um, once again, thank you all. We had a wonderful time with you, and we hope to have a wonderful time upstairs with you. So we'll see you soon. <laughs> Graduates, graduates, please rise and follow the band. Thank you.